Diese Konferenz wird nun aufgezeichnet. Good afternoon, dear members, industry colleagues and respected speakers. A hearty welcome to all of you to today's seminar on introduction to robot safety and safe cutting techniques. German Engineering Federation BDMA. I hope all of you and your family and colleagues are safe and doing well. I'm uh, John Lee, based out of the Mumbai office of VDMA, and I'll be taking through the session. We would request all of you to kindly mute your microphones for better viewing experience. Kindly keep uh, it on view active camera mode, and you could continue to post your questions during the entire session in the chat box. And the questions would be taken up in the last leg of the web seminar. The new World Robotics 2020 Industrial Reports show a record of 2.7 million industrial robots operating in factories around the world. This is an increase of 12%. Sales of new robots remain a high level with 3,73,000 units shipped globally in 2019 and is the third highest sales volume ever recorded. The adoption of human-robot collaboration is on the rise. We saw cobot installations grew by 11%. This dynamic sales performance was in contrast to the overall trend with the traditional industrial robots in 2019. As more and more suppliers offer collaborative robots and the range of applications become bigger, the market has reached now to 4.8%. Although this market is fairly new and in the infant stages. To compare the robotization of economies with various populations, the number of robots in use per 10,000 employees in manufacturing is a good measure. The average robot density for overall robotized economies in the world now stands at 113 robots per 10,000 employees. For Germany, with the ranking of fourth, it is at 346. India's robot density stands at six robots per 10,000 employees in 2019 and is growing at the rate of 15% on an average over the past five years, but it still leaves a lot of room for improvement. India is one of the strongest growing economies amongst the Asian emergent markets and since 2009, the number of installations has been growing rapidly at a CAGR of 15% between 2014 and 2019. In 2019, India ranked 10th in terms of installations worldwide. Following the global trend, robot installations declined by 10% in 2019 and has reached 4,299 units, whereas it was at its peak in the year 2018, where we stood at 4,771 units. The automotive industry remains by far as the largest customer industry, accounting to 43% of installations in 2019. While the installations in the rubber and plastics, as well as those in the electronic sector has significantly declined, installations in the metal industry continue to grow by adding to another 35% reaching to 553 units. Between 2014 to 2019, the metal industry increased the annual robot installations by 27% on an average per year. Regarding the operational stock, India is a true runner-up with a new record of 26,300 units, which, which are actually running in the factories today in India. With this is a ranking of 12th in the world, and currently with welding and technology and uh, is the, on the top on the applications, and this is followed by handling and dispensing. Globally, COVID-19 has a strong impact on 2020, but it also offers a chance of modernization and digitization of production on the way to recovery. In the long run, benefits of increasing robot installations remain the same. Rapid production and delivery of customized products at competitive prices are the main incentives. Automation enables manufacturers to keep their production in developed economies or reshore it without sacrificing the cost efficiency. The range of industrial robots continues to expand from traditional cage robots capable of handling all payloads quickly and precisely to new collaborative robots that work safely alongside humans. Robot safety standards are still evolving and will continue to evolve as the global market for industrial robots grows and inevitably changes. They play an important role in the international adoption of industrial robots. The increased use of robots in performing tasks along with humans raises the novel occupational safety and health issues. <laughs> This is an emerging trend driven by greater efficiency and high productivity, as well as
I'll request our attendees to kindly keep themselves on the mute for better experience in listening. The 21st century workplace will be one in which the operational robotics plays an important role. Regardless of the robot type, the introduction of new technology in workplaces inevitably brings safety risk. Today's web seminar highlights the hazards associated with robot operations in general and provides companies with an overview of the possible control measures that can be put in place for a safe working environment and mitigate the risk to workers. Safety does not happen by accident. It starts with awareness, and awareness starts with each one of us connected to the industry. Always remember, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Next slide. VDMA, the Mechanical Engineering Industry Association, was founded in November 1892 and has been the most important voice for the engineering industry. VDMA currently represents 3,300, mostly medium-sized companies, making it the largest industry association in Europe currently contributing to 78% as exports, and this is equivalent to 232 billion euro production. Recognizing the very early significance of India as a future market for our member companies, India was the first overseas office amongst the BRIC countries. VDMA stands to be the only German industrial association having well-established offices in India since several years, currently based in Noida and Kolkata, Mumbai and Bangalore. Next slide. We are honored to have Mr. Manfred Auster, the Council General Fed Republic of Germany from Kolkata to join us today as an esteemed chief guest. He shall make a special address to us on the Indo-German collaboration for strengthening the bilateral trade. Mr. Ramakari, who is the head safety services from Business for Pills India, will share his insights on the introduction to robotic safety, robotic safety standards and regulations, and safeguarding techniques in robotics. My colleague, Mr. Sandeep Roy, who is the regional head for the Eastern region for VDMA, will be taking up the Moderation for the Q&A session. Next slide. Mr. Auster has been serving the Federal Republic of Germany as a diplomat since 1991. He studied the law at the Freie Universität in Berlin till 1986. Mr. Auster started his distinguished career as a foreign diplomat by serving at the German consulate in Kiev in Ukraine. He's also served in the consulate in countries like Australia, Hungary, and Canada. A prestigious posting for Mr. Auster was at the NATO in Brussels. And before joining in the Council General in Kolkata in September, he served as the German ambassador to Haiti. With no further delay, Mr. Austria, I'd like to welcome you for your kind address. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. John, uh, Mr. Roy, Mr. Bowery. Um, I'm very grateful for you that you gave me a slightly broader topic to talk about than the one that is actually the topic of today's uh, webinar, because I would probably feel a little bit overwhelmed in introducing or speaking on the topics that will be on today's agenda. But when it comes to the question of um, Indo-German collaboration and for strengthening the bilateral trade ties, I think I can um, add a few points and a few questions to that and give you a little bit of a flavor of what current thinking is, but also to hopefully entice a little bit of thought in the listeners today and the people who have joined us. So perhaps let's start with the current situation that we're living in. It is a pandemic. And if anything, I think that this pandemic has shown us that we share a joint responsibility um, a joint responsibility that manifests itself in the big broad schemes like working together on the development of the vaccines down to the very individual behavior of every one of us as in wearing masks in, in, in public and uh, doing social distancing 
as much as we regret to do that, especially during festive seasons, be it here in India, Diwali, uh, be it in, in Europe, in Germany for the upcoming Christmas holidays. But we share that responsibility. And therefore, I would like to say to you that my feeling is that Indo-German collaboration means also living up to these shared responsibilities. Now, we'll talk a little bit about what that means for me. But we share responsibilities while we divide the tasks that come with it. We are and we see different actors. They are state actors like this consulate, like the diplomatic service of Germany, but they are also the private sector. And that is uh, whom you and your members are representing in this game. And both of those are subdivided again. We see that we have the federal and state levels, both in Europe, where it is true for the European Union um, and its member states, and inside Germany, even Germany, even for the Bundesländer, our states. But we see it likewise here in India with the center and the states and territories. And on the business side, we also see that there are the individual companies and enterprises, and we see the like, let's say umbrella organizations like VDMA, like the Chambers of Commerce and Industry um, and, and other entities. So we have a kind of conglomerate of different actors in this field, but I believe that we all should work for the same, same final goals. But before addressing those, um, the title that you gave me also speaks about how we can strengthen the bilateral trade. Um, let me ask back, what is bilateral trade nowadays anyway? Is that trade between countries? I think that is probably hard to define, at least for, for Germany, it's harder to define than you might think. Because trade is the sole responsibility and jurisdiction of the European Union nowadays. Germany doesn't conclude any trade agreements, for instance. That is exclusively the domain of the European Commission. Um, we are in Europe a single market and we act as one on the global stage. But then at the same time, we still compare also internally our figures, our trade balances and all that. And companies compete with each other. They compete each other, with each other for markets and for orders. And um, we also see that another of the players that I've mentioned, the lender in the German case, the states of the union in India, they compete with each other, right? They all have their trade and investment um, authorities. They all have companies or length arms agencies that are trying to promote and attract more foreign direct investment to their regional jurisdiction. So. Again, it is competition there, which makes it a little bit complicated to, to say what is bilateral trade. But that competition is not necessarily something bad. I think that competition usually is something positive. It drives progress. Um, we only have to make good and sometimes perhaps better use of that progress, or we have to look clearly into what we mean by progress. In the past, we have seen quite often, perhaps too often, that shareholder value is a dominant factor for many companies in this regard. That shareholder value rules um, over what I would say is the wider responsibility that all these stakeholders, all these players have as corporate or global citizens of the world. And there we have to find the right balance because clearly, when companies are not flourishing, if they're going to the brink of bankruptcy, then they cannot act responsible and they can't act at all. So that is something that needs to be avoided. And for that, they have to make, uh, they have to make profit margins. On the other hand, they must not forget, forget about um, their responsibility, shared responsibility, I say, um, globally and with other companies and with other players together. So I think we have made some progress in that regard over the last decade or so. 
but there's still some cases where we can do better. Now, when we come back to, the, to these different stakeholders and the different players in it, what is the role of our side, the states and the representatives of the states in strengthening trade? I think we have to, to be the um, scene setters. We have to set the scenes and we have to come up with the rules that are governing the exchange, the exchange between companies, the exchanges that companies in different <laughs> jurisdictions, different uh, countries do, um, but also the, the, the rules that the states are uh, kind of imposing on those actors. And uh, with that, I mean, we need a kind of rules-based international system like the WTO, for instance, that guarantees that we have what we call the level playing field. Now, I might do a little bit of an excurs excursion here into level playing field because that's a key word in the current uh, in the current negotiations that the European Union does with a third country, um, with the United Kingdom, who uh, the United Kingdom had, as you know, decided to leave the Union at the beginning of 2020, wow. and so they did. Um, and now the question is, for how we are going to proceed. Um, proceeding means in this, in this case that we have to find between the European Union and the UK, a level playing field that allows for us as a union to open our markets to products from, from the island, from the UK, um, without falling into a trap where rules that we have established inside the union for the benefit of uh, workers in the social domain, for the benefit of the environment, uh, in environmental protection, for the benefit of customers and customers' protection. Uh, these kind of rules that we have set for our market are not circumvented by a country that doesn't abide by these rules any longer, which in this case, in this example, would be uh, the United Kingdom, um, with them exporting to our markets in a in the sense of having a free market access as they used to have during their membership in the union. So that's what we mean with level playing field. And I think we can use that terminology also on the global stage. So we have to, to see that countries that engage in trade or countries whose companies are engaging in trade um, are not discriminated against each other and find the the best possible um, and the safest kind of environment for their business to flourish in that one. So again, I think that is what, what states should do to set this level playing field. But it goes further because I briefly mentioned uh, WTO rules, uh, things of that. It means that you can conclude free trade agreements. And here I might just allude to the fact that the European Union and India have been in negotiations for a free trade agreement uh, for quite a number of years now. Uh, these negotiations have not proceeded too well uh, over the last uh, few years. And um, I would hope that we can have our negotiators and our leaders agree on a comprehensive and rather ambitious free trade agreement between between the two sides but i don't dare to give any um, any kind of estimate by when that is going to happen uh, because interests are there interests some of which are absolutely justified and uh, reasonable and then there are also other interests which you might th say is in the global scheme of things not necessarily helpful to pursue and i would say this is probably true for both sides that are negotiating that so free trade agreements uh, of a modern and um, kind of comprehensive approach should cover more than just access to markets or put it the other way around they should again have also take also into account those elements um, of of market access that are not directly linked to to trade issues but to those fields that i mentioned earlier like um, like the environmental standards, like social standards, like human rights, and um, so 
giving us and everyone who is moving, who is acting in this kind of then joint space, uh, the same rights and the same possibilities. I think that's very important. And um, I might again just mention that uh, before I went to Haiti, I was uh, four years the deputy head of mission for the European Union. Uh, in Canada, and that was at the time when the Canada-EU Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement was negotiated, which uh, is the example, which is what we call the, the gold standard for trade agreements, because as the name suggests, it is comprehensive. It covers the elements and fields that I have mentioned and discussed earlier, and therefore I think you cannot necessarily put that one-to-one -one on out for the negotiation between the EU and India. But it is something that I would, um, in the global perspective, think gives a good example, gives some kind of a guideline to, to strive to achieve between our two markets and regions. So that would be the role of the states, or in the case of the Euro European Union, of the Union, um, we have sometimes a little jurisdictional problem in defining what exactly we as the EU are. Uh, we are probably, there's a consensus that we are not a state, but we are more than just a confederation. So something in between, anyhow, uh, that only a side remark from, from an international lawyer that, that uh, is really interested in that question. That is what we can do on that side. What is the role of business and industry now in strengthening trade? Well, I think um, it is to, to beef up in the innovation, which then leads to more competitiveness, which is at the same time challenging uh, the, the other competitors, uh, the other players in the market to, to come up to something uh, equal to get them going. Um, it is probably also for business and business representatives in the industry to engage in lobbying. Lobbying quite often has a negative connotation, which I don't think is fair. I think lobbying is something that has its place in this world, it has place in our forms of economies that we are, we are dealing with. It should be a transparent form of lobbying, but to say that my interest is A, B, C, and D, and I would like to have that being reflected in legislation uh, is totally fair to my understanding. Anyhow, having said that, it also means that it doesn't allow for just a free, uh, the, the possibility to freely engage in no matter what kind of lobbying. Certainly, as I said earlier, I believe in rules-based systems um, for the global exchange, but I also believe in rules-based systems in, in the markets themselves. So while lobbying for the interests of, of a company or a sector or industry, I believe the underlying ideas and responsibilities as a corporate citizen uh, always needs to be considered as well. They need to be mainstreamed into it. And uh, in a combination of these kind of things, uh, we will probably prosper in the long run. It might mean that for some time, the it is not only the growth rate that is the factor uh, against which success will be judged. There are other elements into it. One of India's, India's neighbors, Bhutan, has uh, done it very uh, prominently in the past and saying it's not just national growth per product, uh, GDP that, that counts for us. It's also other elements of social happiness that, that are involved. You don't necessarily have to go that far as, um, as a business or an enterprise, but it is something that always should be on your mind as well. And when you ask me, well, what is that concretely? I think we have a pretty, pretty clear guidance from the United Nations where all the countries of the world have adopted the Agenda 2020 and the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and one of them is, for example, uh, fighting the climate crisis and going against it. And here, state, states and, uh, and state entities are certainly in the forefront of uh, doing their bit in it and coming up with regulations where necessary. 
But again, I would make the plea for, for companies and industry to do the same thing. And uh, we have seen that this is actually the case. There are numerous companies who totally reasonably also make use of, um, of campaigns in the environment for their own profile to make it sure that, that their companies get a better standing globally, that they get uh, sympathy from, from the consumers. And if a consumer has a choice between two more or less equal products, but one of the companies has a better image in that sense, I believe the, the consumer will choose the company with a better image. Um, and that is then a factor that I would make another plea for, for you and your members to, to realize. Um, last but not least, what, what is the conclusion of all that? I think that strengthening bilateral trade is important, but it is not a means in itself. It serves a common wealth. And it is based on our rep responsibilities in this global setting. And once again, I believe that the, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals from the United Nations should guide us in that. And we should uh, consider them whenever we talk about improving these elements, whenever we talk about improving our own standing as well. So much for that. Thank you very much. And all the best for the rest uh, of the seminar. I will happily listen in to quite a bit of the proceedings, but I might drop out at one stage before that. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, so much, Mr. Austria. I think uh, you gave a very holistic approach to how the scenario is, and there is definitely much more we need to contribute individually beyond the free trade. I agree to it completely. Thank you. I'd like to now welcome our next speaker for today, Mr. Amol Bari. So Mr. Bari has a 20 plus years experience in automation industry with project experience bringing machines into conformance to legislative, international, and European standard requirements for missionary safety, particularly through the missionary safety life cycle. He's the head of the Department of Safety Services with experience covering projects from the concept to detailed engineering and commissioning and operations through support. I'd like to not delay it any further. Over to you, Amol. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Yamli. Uh, good afternoon, good afternoon, Mr. Oster, uh, VDMA team, and all participants. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to all of you. Uh, today's topic is about the introduction to uh, robotic safety. Now we will start. Uh, I will start my presentation. So screen is visible to all? Yes, I'm all. it's fine. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so before starting to robotic safety, nowadays we want, uh, we know about uh, the robots. And Jamli uh, already uh, uh, given some uh, lookout of, uh, about the robots, how many robots are used in the industries. So now this is a trend where most of the uh, most of the companies are using the robots for the automatic operation now when we are talking about the automatic operation at that time the speed of the machines as well as the speed of the operations are very important and in that this, uh, rapid speed of operations robot are used and when we are talking about the speed in the operation at that time there is a risk involved in the operations and when robot is working in in the in the operational environment at that time there are multiple risks are involved so the safeguarding of the robot is very important and that today's topic is about the introduction of the robot safety and the safety safeguarding technology so firstly we will start with the introduction to robot safety most of you know about that the robots are used in many applications where the more of a production industries, assembly robots, pressure welding, bonding, sealing. There are different operations where the robots are used. Handling equipments like mounting, palletizing, stacking, packing areas. 
then the painting, measuring, welding, grinding, different applications, cutting, plasma cutting, milling, sawing. So such type of applications, robots are used. And when robots are used, so there is a safety standard, or we can say the, we need to follow the standard to integrate the robot in, in the robotic cell. So for that, there is a uh, international standard that is a 10218 dash, and that section two is related to the integration of the cell. How the robot is used in the robotic cell, or how to integrate that robot with the machines. So these one uh, ISO 10218-2 is giving the requirements, safety requirements for integration of the safety. And 10218-1, it is talks about the safety in the robot itself. So you can see one picture where there is a classical safeguarding technology is already used in the robots. So like you can see, there is a interlocking guard as well. There is a light curtain or, or the we can say there is an open access from the right hand side and where light curtain is used. So the, the, with the help of safety, safety, uh, safe, safe technology, the robot cell is safeguarded. So, in the industrial application, have a very nowadays it's a very high level of automation is used in the uh, industries. So, as you go in any automotive industry, you will see that there all are the all operations are auto automated, and where number of robots are used for the application to get the maximum productivity. So human intervention into product and process is subject to high safety standard because when human is interve intervening the operation at that time, there should not be any hazardous situation and due to that accidental condition should not happen. And for that purpose, there is a high safety standard and that safety standards is nothing but a ISO 1021-2 where all the requirements you can find, uh, you can get. And this high, le uh, high level of safety standards will, will give the safety, uh, will, will give the guarantee of the safety and the availability availability of the operation. So if, if it is giving the safety and the availability of the, uh, uh, availability of the operation, then definitely the productivity will not happen. So access to the monitor via the safe sensor technology. So different, different sensors are used where this sensor will give the reliability of the operation and it will it, it will it will safeguard the safeguard the person when entering into the robotic cell or when there is an intervention is required during the operation so there are various operating principles and designs are used depending upon the requirement that is the installation position boundary condition relating to the application so there in the robot when you are uh, uh programming the uh, you are programming the robot at that time there are multiple zones we need to we need to program it where this robot will work into that particular area so the human intervention if by chance it is happen it will be protected by the safety sensors then the new technology is a hrc technology that is a human robot collaboration where the person or the we can say the operator and the robot work in work hand in hand so in addition to the classical robotic cell fully enclosed robot cells there's a human collaborative robotic cells are increasingly in demand because it will give a more productivity as well the we can program it as per the requirements the uh, yeah human robot collaboration the work areas of the humans and the robot overlap in terms of the space and the time. So human and the robot are working in the same zone, uh, same zone or we can say there is an overlapping of the zones or overlapping of the space where both both person as well as the robot can work or it may sometimes it may work alone or it, sometimes it may work. Uh, uh, they both work in that uh, same place at the same time. And depending upon the time, depending upon the space, we can program it and accordingly safety has safety need to be taken. 
So what should be considered when we are talking about the human robot collaboration? So when there is a human and human is interacting with the robot at that time, there should not be interact there, there should not be intervention between the person and the robot so that fence must go. Second, work area of the human and the robot become blurred. So there is a clear cut identification of the areas where the robot is working and where the human is working. And if there is an overlap on the working areas, human is no longer always calculable. Then the robot needs a power because robot is having the power. And when the robot is working with the human at that time, that power, it should not give the power which is required for the operation. So it should understand the when a person is collaborating with the robot and accordingly that power can be power can be changed or we can say the torque of the motors can be changed and accordingly that operation can happen and it should not lead to the accident so history history of the robot so might be in the old plants you can see something something uh, where robots are robots are protected with such type of fence guards so all all everywhere you will see you will see the fencing and if there is a requirement to enter into the robotic cell there is a one interlocking system available maybe you can see in the right hand side where interlocking guard is there and person can intervene the operation by opening the guard so that is a very conventional technology, conventional safety technology. That is a you can see the massive fence. That is a three. The, 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 it is protected 360 degree of the machine. Then the new system with some openable access. Wherever there is a requirement, then you can see in the right hand side there is a light curtain, and uh, as well you can see in the front side there is an interlocking guard. So there is a newer technology where fence is open fence is open with the help of light grey or the light curtain and with the help of enabling switch also so enabling switch is nothing but a one handled device where you can use that particular switch and you can intervene the operation so all with the where, wherever there is a wherever there is a requirement that there is an open access is required for the operation then at that time in the previous technology it was little bit difficult but now in the new technology it is easy again the new technology is there that is with the camera based system so fence is not available at all and with the help of camera we can identify the zones different zones and the identification uh, identify the entering of the object or the person and accordingly the area can be safeguarded so from the safety fence to the safety camera based system that that uh, that technology is advanced and it is a uh, safety fence is the history now new technology new uh, safety sensors is a future so that is a safe, safe safe sensor technology or safe camera based system that is optical based sensor technology and the speed of the system can be managed or can be controlled with the help of different zones which are programmed in the safety camera business so robots often supplied independently of safeguards like there are two things one is a robot and another is a robot used in the application so always most of you see that there are many multiple there are many manufacturers who, who can who can manufacture robot alone and then the integrator will integrate that robot in the application so system integrator is often responsible for the safety because that system integrator is integrating that robot in the application along with the different operating station, maybe conveyor, maybe machines. And then whenever there is an interaction happen and that time we need to take care of the safety. So system integrator is often responsible for the safety when we are talking about the robotic cell or the robotic integration. End user may be responsible for the safety because end user is using that application at their uh, at their plant. Personal offer enter the robotic cell. 
for the activities different activities like the maintenance activity teaching activity verification activity so these are different activities where the person can enter into the robotics and he is interacting with the robot and it requires a complex and technical solution and when we are talking about this robotic integration so uh, the integrator is integrating that ro integrating that robot in the application and then uh, then the training is very much required for the the people who are maintaining that particular robotics cell. so training is a, is of a staff in a legislative and statutory requirement of a robotic safety are critical to ensure that the integration and programming of the robots is complete, completed in a safe manner so these are the requirements from the safety standard where we need to check it we need to verify it and then we can say we this particular robot set is a verified or verified as per the safety standards and then it can be it can it is ready for the operation so what are the different standards and regulations are related to the robots and the robot integration so if you see there are old standards like en 775 that is a european standard for manipulating industrial robots it is this standard is related to safety of the robots then the ansi or the ria r15-06 that is the american national standard for the industrial robots and the robotic system that is the what are the safety requirements for, for the robotic application and now these two standards are merged and that the, the standard is a iso that is the international standard that is a 10218 and that is adopted by the europe also so that it is a en iso 102128 is equal to the ansi ri 15-06 that is a european american national standard and there are two parts in this standard that is the one part one that that we call it as iso 102188-1 that is related to robot that is a safety requirement uh, safety requirement of the robot and the part two that signifies the robotic system and its integration the safety requirement for the robotic system and its integration so i the 10218-1 so what it it contains guidelines for how to guarantee safety when designing and building a robot for the industrial sector so dash one one zero two one eight dash one is giving the guideline for designing and building the robots for the industrial sector in a safe operation with safe operation also it defines the requirement of guidelines for the inherently safe design for protective measures and information for use so these are the three terms that is a safe design the second one is a protective measure that is called as the engineering control and third one is the information for use or the administrative control so these are the three elements or the three steps we need to follow in while designing the robot for the industrial application it also considers the robot to be to be a partially completed machinery because robot is a partially completed machinery because robot alone cannot work as a machine we cannot consider robot as a machine when it will be integrated in the application and it it is doing some app doing some activity then it is a complete machine so robot itself or if you buy a robot we cannot use that robot for the application without integration with some actuators some intermediate auxiliary machines then and then only it will be a complete machine so robot is a partially completed machine in accordance with the standard robot consists of what main parts of the uh, robot that is a manipulator that is manipulator including the actuators then the control devices including the handle programming devices and the any communication interface like that is a hardware and the software so manipulator that is including actuator means all the arms with the with actuation with the servo motors and other and other control devices like the servo drives the controller required for the robots and the other communication interface like the handle terminal work handle terminal communicating 
over the Wi-Fi and other. So these are the main uh, thing. Uh, 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 we can say the robot LM, uh, robot consistent. So the robot. Uh, when we we, uh, we talked about the robot, the robot safety is in relation with the I two one zero two one eight dash. The sec the second part or the part two is for the integration of the robot. So integration of the robot, these parts that is a one zero two one eight dash define safety requirement for the integration of the robot and the robotic system as well as the robotic system. And that integration includes what are the different things <clears throat> like sorry design, manufacture, installation, operation, maintenance, and decommissioning of the robotic system or a cell. Second one that is necessary information about the above name points, like each and every stage we need information or the detailed information about the act activity. Then standard also defines the requirement for the robotic system as a part of integrated manufacturing system. That is a standard ENISO triple one six one as a part of an assembly or a group of machines. So this standard also refer we need to refer during this during this integration activity of the robot integration activity uh, for robot integration activity of the robotic cell uh, robotic cell. Standard does not deal specifically with the hazard in conjunction with the processes like laser, like ejected shock or the welding fumes and other. Because all these things are covered under the basic safety standard that is ISO 12100. And that 12100, it talks about the basic terminology for the risk assessment. Then in accordance with the safety standard, robot system consists of robot that is the uh, the manipulator or we can say the access movement multiple access movement then the end effector and the tool that tool is required to uh, do the operation any machine equipment any machines or equipment devices external auxiliary access or sensor that supports the robot and it's ex execute the task so this assembly whole assembly where the uh, 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 devices like access consist of these motors and drives with the arms and the sensors related to it like encoders or some end limit sensors and it will execute the task the, the, depending upon the program feed into the robot so when we are talking about the hazards in the robotic cell and that hazards we need to identify and that hazard identification, we can do it with the risk assessment procedure. So what we need to do for the risk assessment? So if you see that annexer A of ISO 10218-2 is presents a list of hazards commonly found in the robots. What are those hazards? That, that hazards are different hazards like intended use of the robot during that uh, there are risks present during the operations that is the uh, intended use of the robot that is the uh, teaching maintenance setting clean cleaning these are some of the activities and we need to carry out the risk assessment for each and every hazard for each and uh, each and every uh, operation so that is unexpected starter this is one of the hazard then assess by personnel from all direction that is the, that may be the, uh, the, the, the it may be possible reasonable possible misuse of the robot so we need to identify the hazard related to this particular area then the effect of failure in the control system so if the control failure, control system fail what will happen if whether it's a fail safe system or if, uh, if if this particular system is failed then the accidental condition may happen so we need to check the different hazards during this activity. Hazards associated with the specific robot application, like welding, like you, you, you all know about welding application. So where welding sparks, 
or whenever we uh, we are appro appro uh, when, uh, there is a sparks uh, sparks and that sparks if it is coming out of the robotic cell okay it may harmful and there is a thermal hazard present in the welding application and iso 12100 which i mentioned about that is a provide the guidance for the performing the hazard identification and the risk reduction measures so basic standard like for all the machine when we are talking about the risk assessment that we refer iso 12100 for performing the hazard identification but there are specific hazards present in the robotic cell and that guidance we will get it into get in iso 12200 and so robot hazards so mechanical hazards what are the mechanical hazards that is unexpected movement that is a collision with the operator then shearing between the moving parts trapping between the robot and fencing electrical hazards like live parts indirect contact then hot surfaces like high temperature parts, motors, etc., high temperature tools, noise, noise related hazards, vibration related hazards, radiation. Like if you talk about laser, then laser is radiating the laser field. Then in the laser welding, you will find the radiation hazard. Then the material hazards, like lubrication fluids, which we are using. So some of the so some of the fluids are the hazardous hazardous uh, fluids. Then the ergonomic hazards. So these are the different hazards present in the robotic cell, and we need to identify that hazards, and then accordingly we need to go for risk reduction with the help of safeguarding mechanism. So what are the different safeguarding mechanisms in the we can we can provide to the robotic cell? So who are we who are we protecting so just the the picture where the robot is there the robotic cell and uh, the person uh, the person or the operator or the maintenance person is doing uh, want to do some activity so who are who are we protecting so different different people we need to protect it from the robotic hazard or if there is a there is a there is an accidental condition due to the robotic uh, due to robot then there are different people who can who who, uh, who are accessing to the robotic cell or indirectly or directly people not working with the robot that they are that 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 people also we need to protect it people how and uh, how we can say that like people who work in the area of area or people passing by passing by from the robotic cell second one operators who control or interact with the robot may have to reach to the robotic area then third one maintenance people doing the maintenance work close to the robot and close to the hazard so during the maintenance activity person who is calibrating the robot and testing the robot so these are the people we need to protect it now when we need to protect the people or we need to safeguard to the safeguard uh, we, we need to provide the safeguard to the robot itself that time we we need to follow certain rules or the follow certain guidelines and what are these guidelines that that is called as a three step method as per the iso 12100 that is a basic terminology for the risk assessment and what it says that is a first one that is a risk reduction by inherently safe design measures so during the design itself we need to understand the understand the hazard and need to take care of this particular hazard and need to reduce that particular hazard in the design stage itself so we will see the example how we can then second step risk reduction by safeguarding or implementation of complementary 
protective measures. We also call it as an engineering, engineering control because we are implementing the safety or we are implementing the safety devices to mitigate that particular risk. And third step is a risk reduction by information of use. That is a risk, uh, 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 we can say, um, uh, effect, least effective, and this is an administrative control. So just say this is the hierarchy of the control where there is a first step is the elimination and substitution, and the final stage is the administrative control like with a personal protective equipment. So elimination or substitution. What we need to do, that is, we can call it as a, we need to change the design, like change the process to eliminate the human interaction, elimination of the pinch point, automatic material handling. So this particular activity, we can do it in the design stage and we call it as a inherently safe design. Second stage, second step, that is the engineering control, that is a safeguarding technology and where we can use mechanical hard stops, barriers, interlocks, presence sensing devices, two hand controls. So that is a second step. And third, fourth and five, that is a awareness that that is an administrative control and awareness like with lights, beams, signs, papers, horns, labels, etc. Fourth one, training and procedure that is an administrative control. Like we need to prepare our SOPs, give the training to the operators. We follow the lockout tagouts. We train the people that, that uh, need to follow. And the final one is a personal protective equipment that is a PPE, like safety glasses, helmets, goggles, gloves, and other. So most effective is the elimination or substitution, or we can say that is a, in the design state, we need to reduce the particular risk. And then accordingly, next steps we need to take care if it is not possible to do it in the first stage, second stage, and then we need to follow the third step. So just see, there is a one example where we can see that is elimination or substitution. So that is a robot, person is passing by, and if there is a robot movement, that robot can hit to the person. Now, what we can do, we can put a the safety guard or the safety fence so that the, the, the robot cannot robot can uh, uh, hit the uh, hit the fence not the person now if you see the second second case where that robot can hit the fence but now we have added some mechanical stoppers mechanical stoppers in the robot so and we we need to adjust that particular mechanical stopper such that there will not be any further movement of the robotic arm and that particular movement will be stopped at that particular point. So these are some of the techniques we need to use in the robot itself or in the robotic integration with the fence. So person who would walk in passage which identifies as a hazard if guarding is not capable of continuing the full robot movement, containing the full robot movement. Then mechanical stops attached to the robot and, and reinforce guarding, prevent the robot from entering the passage way beyond the guarding. So the mechanical stoppers and the additional material or additional reinforced material in the mechanical, mechanical fencing will give you the adequate disk reduction measure in the, when there is an accidental condition or that is if there is an unexpected movement happen in the robotic, uh, uh, with the robot. So second one, that is the engineering control that you can see there are different engineering control like in the front side, you can see that is an interlock guard. So you can see one switch, you can see there is a one switch for the uh, door. That is a guard locking switch or the interlock guard, uh, interlock switch. So that is called as an engineering control. So with the engineering control, we can safeguard the safeguard the person. Then what are the different safeguards? That is a guarding, fixed guarding, interlocks, that is the interlocks with guarding. Then the present sensing devices, like maybe a light curtain or the uh, safety mats or laser scanners. Then the two hand control, where the both the hands of the person 
will be engaged during the operation of the movement. Software related safety functions of the robot, like some of the safety, so software related functions like safe off and other, that will be controlled through the logic. So these are some of the engineering controls we can provide to, to reduce the risk during the operation. And there are automatic act acting devices requiring uh, requiring no action from person to prevent the injury. So these are some of the devices which are automatically acting, which will we will configure with the control devices, and then accordingly the hazardous movement of the robot can stop. Third one that is the least um, uh, we can say the effective. That is the information of use, like it is totally a person dependent or the human dependent. Because if they follow, then 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 only it will be effective. So like signs, then uh, uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, some of the screens where we can see the different operation, the, the, the different operation with the some of the uh, indications. So these are the these are the, 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 the this is the third step where we can use the administrative. So that is a science. Machine operation board maintenance manuals, processes, uh, procedures, trainings, and etc. And uh, train the user with or uh, 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 for the specific machine operation. Different types of guards. That is a fixed guard. Then the movable guard, adjustable guard, interlocking guard, interlocking guard with the guard locking. So these are the different guards. Fixed guard, like a fence, is a fixed guard. Fixed, it is fixed with uh, uh, with so, some of the special tools and some of the special fasteners. Movable guards, movable, like it is moving, uh, moving. But if the, the, the it is automatically moving when there is when there is means it will uh, like one example of the movable guard, movable guard is a telescopic telescopic guard. So that guard is also moving when there is a when there is a when the, we can say the hazardous area it will be covered during the operation when there is a when when we want to access then it automatically automatically compressed like that so it's a movable guard then third one is the adjustable third one is sorry this this is the adjustable guard then the movable guard then interlocking guard interlocking interlocking guard is will be, is with the safety devices which will give the signal and accordingly control device will take the action to stop the motion interlocking guard with the guard locking where the there, there is an interlocking with the switch but locking of the system will also happen so anybody cannot open it without unlocking the guard or unlock uh, unlocking that particular system so these are the different uh, different types of guards we can use in the robotic set. Then, when there is an open access required, then such type of guards will not be feasible. Then we can go for the such type of devices. It is called as the light curtains, or we can say the ESP devices, electrosensitive protective devices. And there are there is a the, this type these type of devices works on the principle like these are there are two columns. One is the emitter and another is the receiver. Then that particular, the, the, these are working with the light beam with a the narrow beam with divergence less than one degree. Then it is having some technology that is called as a modulated type light technology. Otherwise, other light can interfere in, into, into it and it, it may malfunction so that this modulated light beam technology is used. Then the use of test pulses, that is again, the, this uh, use of a test pulses is a technology where you can detect the short circuit of the signals. Then the fail to save technology, that is a very important technology that that is that signifies the reliability of the product. So always this product will fail into the safe condition. Then the control units having the redundancy. So that this particular redundancy is a homogeneous redundancy and that redundancy says that redundancy means two and that two signals are used and that two signals if the both signals are present then we will say that is a safe signal then the resolution will be as low as 14 mm because 
finger can be protected and if you say that is a finger can be protected then resolution that is a resolution means that is a distance between the two beam it is a 14 mm and that is a minimum distance between the two uh, beams and that is a 14 mm technology 14 mm uh, sensors then muting muting is again one uh, function where suspension of the safety function is required Sub uh, uh, for some of the application where the material is passing through the uh, light curtain area and that time it should not be interrupted and it should act as a process cycle and there is a muting uh, we can say the uh, muting process uh, uh, through that we can we, uh, we can we can avoid the interruption of the light, light curtain when the material is passed through the area so these are the different technologies you can see there are pictures where material entry and exit because see like in the robotic cell there are conveyors and when the conveyors are used then again that time the person should not reach to the particular point and that with that uh, for that purpose we can see that there is a access here that a person can reach a person can put his hand from this particular entry point and reach to the uh, position of the robot or person that robot can reach to that particular point and for that purpose there is a tunnel guard is used so that the tunnel will give you the additional distance to, for the person not to reach to the hazardous point and another another technology that is the ESPA technology or the electrosensitive protective equipment technology we call it as a light curtain technology also and that light curtain is installed so the anybody can if you uh, anything any object or the person interrupts that light curtain immediately the system will go into the halt mode so again safety the when we are entering into the robotic enclosure at that time different safeguarding technologies are used like here in the picture you can see that there is a door and where person can open the door and go into the uh, go inside the robotic cell but at the same time we need to follow some of the things like zero energy access that is a loto lockout tagout so the the energy will be fully isolated then the interlocking guard that is an interlocking you can see there is an interlocking switch over here and the, the, the when the door is open then interlocking switch will give the control signal and it will stop the movement to stop the hazardous movement then alternative protective measures that is called as APM and these particular uh, uh, alternative protective measures are different measures which are the which are the features of the control technology that is a motion disable lockable switch lockable gate interlock up against the hard stop movable stop or the pin and the present sensing devices so these are some of the devices or the some of the control methods we need to adopt as a alternative protective measures where the full energy isolation is not when when there is a full energy isolation is not possible then we need to follow the alternative protective measures so here in the in this particular robotic cell the sensor unit is installed above the area to be uh, uh, to be monitored any object or the person which enters the guarded area will be detected by the image processing algorithm so in this picture you can see there is a, a different area we have configured with the camera based system and that camera based system is installed at the high uh, at the uh, we can say the uh, certain height of the robotic cell and we can cover the 360 degree area with the uh, with the contour and that particular contour can be programmed with the help of pro programming and this is the technology like Pilsen has developed this technology we call it as a safety R, which is based on the image processing algorithm another technology for the robotic cell that is the trap key mechanism like robotic cell where with different keys and person has to use that particular key or person has to take that particular key whenever he is he is entering into the robotic cell so it is called as a key exchange system also so like there is a one sequence we need to follow that remove key, key a from a isolating the power of the machine so if you 
uh, remove the e, a key then whole uh, power will be isolated then place key uh, key from a to b releasing key uh, from b then door can now be open so now we can access that particular area door now uh, key from b can be written as a safety key or placed c to allow machine run in safe mode then reverse process to restart the machine so this is the sequential control sequential control with the help of key key system then for the teaching of the robot you know that most of the robots are having uh, the teach pendants and many robots are essential to enter into the safeguarded area to robot safeguard, safeguarded space to uh, uh, program the robot so following safeguards must be in place like that is a teach pendant use slow speed control e stop remain functional so always e stop should be always functional because this is the e stop is when we when person is want to stop when person want to stop any active when person want to stop the motion or the whole system at that time there should be some control and that is called as a emergency stop control and it should be always available so for that purpose whenever he is doing that application so e stop functionality should always be in remain functional whenever the he is doing the teaching activity and that teaching activity should be with the slow speed and most of the time we can say it is 10% of the maximum speed again the authorized person should allow to go into the that particular area that is only teacher allowed uh, in safeguarded space then most of the people know about this zero energy lockout that is the lockout tagout be ensure to include means to achieve a zero energy lockout minimize steps by having overall energy lockout means that is a keep some local lockout means to reduce time consider remote voltage lockout methods an employee is required to remove or bypass a machine guard an employee is required to place any part of their body into a point of operation or into a area where machine does work or into the danger zone of the machine operation and essentials if safeguard is no longer protect them essential is if safeguards no longer protect the employee different energies are we can see in the robot that is electrical power always electrical power is required to drive the different arms of the robots which are which are controlled through this robot which are operated through the motors and the drives then the compressors some of the actuators are working with the compressors that is air to grippers and other gravity that is a weld of arm held by the brakes okay some of the vertical movements or uh, potential energy that is a balance springs and the cylinder balance springs and the cylinders so this is the full safety full system with the miss like robot are integrated in the robotic cell so now you can see that is a robot four robots are integrating are integrated into the robot x cell where you can find the different devices or different safeguarding methods like fence safe, safety fencing one then you can see there is a door interlock then you can see the light curtain or the light barriers for at the entry point where multiple access, multiple time entry and exit is required so this is the full full system where you can see the the different safeguarding technology is used so this is all about the safeguarding technology in the robotic cell so i will i will just explain some more things about the pills uh it is i have only three four slides where we will give the brief introduction about the pills in pills company so pills company is a independent automation technology company founded in 1948 our headquarter is in uh hospital it is near to stuttgart it is in germany uh we have staff over 2500 worldwide our uh, turnover 2018 turnover is 340 to 345 million euro 
and 73% of uh, 73% of our business is an export business we have a three pillars that is a three pillars that is a component systems and services and fourfold of safety that is a innovation safe ecological and economic so when we are talking about the three pillars that is a component we are selling the safety components like safety relays safety sensors these are fall under the component act, uh, category then we have a system product where the some intelligence is required like safety plc configurable control system so such type of programmable systems we call it as a system products we again we, it is automation system products and third is the services where we are providing the services like the safety services like safety auditing safety consulting services safety engineering services and the trainings training around the all machinery uh, training around the machinery safety machinery safety technology uh, we call it as a fourfold of safety because see all our products most of our products if you see the pills safety products are, are innovative products you will find uh, something different in the uh, all control products so we will see we will call it as a innovation innovative then okay we are into safety field machinery safety field all our products are safety safety products 90 percent of the products we are the, the uh, material used for the product manufacturing is an ecological material so we call it as ecological it's ecological and what is the benefit of the ecological material so power consumption of the product is very less as compared to the normal material so you will get the benefit of power consumption and at the end if you see with this particular uh, innovative safe and ecological uh, technologies we will be say we will say that our control solution will be economical solution and we are into the automation technology as well safe automation technology uh, global play, we have uh, see uh, our presence is all over world we have a global presence expertise in worldwide for the local standards as well as directive as law uh, laws we the, due to the local presence we have a short delivery times and the fast and local support we have a 42 subsidiaries where 25 sales partners in the components there is a sensor technology control technology drive technology operator interfaces software and the robotics these are under the component technology system technology you can see there is a control systems safety plc's distributed control system so whole automation we can do with the products we can do with the uh, uh, pills products so it's a system products then we have a services pillar where we can provide the services around machinery safety like consulting safety audits engineering safety implementation and the training around trainings different trainings so we we uh, we can offer the services like when we talking talk about the machinery safety so we can provide the service for the machinery safety life cycle from risk assessment safety concept safety design implementation and the validation if the machine manufacturer want to export the machine to the uh, different countries where we can provide the international compliance service like CE marking for the Euro, NR12 for the Brazil, and the US compliance for the uh, 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 America. Then we can provide the services for the workplace safety like plant assessment, lockout, tagout system services, and the inspection of the safeguarding services. So this is the whole portfolio of the PIL services. And other than that, we, we provide the trainings around the machinery safety like robot safety electrical electrical safety standards then the lockout tagout systems risk assessment workshop so such type of trainings we can provide as well the different product trainings we can customize the training for the customers also as per their requirement because most of the customers may have their own uh, Say, uh, own safety guidelines as per that we can mold some of the trainings as per their requirements so when we talk about the machinery safety so there is a special course or we can call it as a qualification 
that is called certified machinery safety expert and this particular training program is a joint activity between pills and the tuv not and tuv not anon so this particular training program we are we already roll out in india uh, this training program uh, this uh, uh, it is a 360 degree where in the with this qualification we can get the benefit of the knowledge like the uh, like the competency of the machinery safety and it's a four day course where the the co the, uh, the uh, course uh, this uh, course contents is having the different uh, different topics related to machinery safety and will be delivered by the pills and the final day the tv not will take the, uh, conduct the examination as an accreditation body and that certification you will get from the tv not so this is the qualification and that qualification you will get with the certification and that certification is with the accreditation from the tv now so as a last we can say we are the ambassador for the safety and our staff have made us one of the leading brands in automation technology bills and staffs are ambassador for safety we make sure that your company's most valuable asset that is your staff can work safely and free from injury so the, around that we can provide the solution with the components with the systems as well we can provide the services in different machinery safety sectors so with this i will end up my presentation if anybody is having some question now we can open the question session and then we can further uh, start that question uh, answer yeah thank you very much yeah thank you uh, amol it's a really uh, comprehensive and uh, covering the various facets of the robotic safety starting from the classical robotic cell standards for robot safety is 10218 uh, integration of robots, hazardous applications, risk assessment, safeguarding mechanism, hierarchy of controls, and the automation technology. Thank you very much. It's indeed a comprehensive, I would say. Uh, Amal, uh, we have received some very interesting questions also from our mm -hmm. uh, audience. So I'll just take one by one. Uh, maybe I may not be able to take all because of the paucity of time. We're slightly running behind the schedule, but which you can um, uh, pass on to you later on, which you can individually respond to them. So uh, to start with, uh, is there any Indian standard uh, for the robotic safety? Yeah, basically, uh, BIS is already working on the uh, standards. Uh, so. Right. Uh, like uh, for the robotic standard uh, okay uh, we need to ch uh, check it but some of the uh, some of the machinery related safety standard already rolled out by the bis uh, but right. i don't think it is a uh, mandate uh, as per the our government laws or the rules but right. in near future definitely you, we will get uh, the standards for everything including the robot perfect thank you uh, the next question is uh, EN 1028 is part of type B or type C standard? Question. It's a type Since C standard. It's a type C okay. standard. And there is another question connected to that. Since robot is falls under the specialized machinery, do we need to mandatorily design minimum safety category architecture CAT 4 circuit and PLE? Uh, no, as per the safety standard uh, 10218-2, uh, the uh, we call it as a SRPCS, safety related parts of the control system. And the minimum requirement is performance level D, CAT 3. But it totally depends upon the assessor also, who is assessing that particular robot. Like you mentioned about CAT 4. Sometimes it may require that we need to go for the CAT 4 performance level E. But the minimum requirement, which is given by the standard, is performance level D, CAT 3, mm -hmm. for the safety function. Fine. That's clear. Thank you so much. Uh, my next question that came up is actually, uh, 
is there a solution to detect a person uh, trapped inside a robotic cell when accidentally all fence doors closed yeah it's possible because there are different devices available like laser scanners which will give the okay. uh, 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 2d scanning area about uh, 275 degree again there are uh, the, the, there is a, another technology that is a safety mat technology where you, you can place that safety mat inside the robotic cell and the person uh, person is stand on it then it will give a control signal so with that means uh, but appropriate appropriate safety sensor along with the control safety control system is required to detect that uh, person inside the robotic cell right thank you and uh, my next question is uh, amol what is the minimum performance level to be achieved in robot safety yeah, yeah basically per, uh, as per the standard performance level d tag 3 but again okay. uh, some of the like uh, where intervention is not there or like uh, some of the doors where uh, uh, the the operating frequency is not uh, um, we can say the once in a month we can open that door so where we are doing the risk assessment that time we can decide whether we need to uh, we need to reduce that performance level or whether we need to go with the uh, uh, as per the requirement from the safety standard that is a 1021 dash two. Okay. But minimum requirement which standard says is a performance level D cat three. Okay. Uh, one of the participants is asking, can a safety camera, a area scanner, safety eye components provide a performance level E? Performance level? E. No. Uh, uh, basically, uh, the safety, uh, safety, uh, safety eye, uh, which I mentioned about. This is the uh, product development from the pills that uh, we uh, we can go uh, we can go up to the performance level D. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And I'll take uh, Amol one more questions. Uh, for taking into consideration of all our attendees timing and all uh, this question at the what are the safe signals to be considered in robot safety programming yeah basically the main uh, safe signal when ro when we are uh, doing the integration with the robotic cell that is the emergency stop of the robot right right that is the main main signal but other than that, there are multiple signal that is a safe, a safe stop, uh, then the safe end limits, then the same safe speed limit. There are different, okay. the different safe signals are available. Which manufacturer can provide as an input signal and we can configure with the, uh, configure with the safety control system. Perfect. Okay, uh, as I mentioned, Amol, thank you very much. Uh, we have another few questions left, but unfortunately, due to the paucity of time, we may not be able to take it. But to uh, conclude, actually, Amol, uh, I'll have a uh, keeping your employees safe and taking on board the key principle and the components of the machine safety is an economic investment that will improve the productivity and the profitability and reduce the employee absence due to injury. Spending on machine safety should not be regarded as necessary evil. And a well-designed safety system won't interfere with your machine efficient cooperation. On the other hand, poorly designed or you consider safety guards might encourage the management operator and the crucial maintenance staff to bypass the essential procedure and fall fail safes, which are significantly increase the risk and might compromise the product quality. Our mindset have already been started to change after this pandemic and clearly the world will never be the same because of there will be long lasting effects of the pandemic. Safety in social life and the industry would gain significance and I hope the webinar today would have helped to give insights on the future of the robot safety. We thank our chief guest, Honorable Consul General Kolkata, Mr. Manfred Oster for his gracious presence and address on this occasion. We thank our knowledge partner, Pills India, 
for their interesting and informative web sessions. And also my co-moderator, Ms. Jamily John, for taking us through the initial part of the today's webinar and rest of my colleagues from the VDMA who helped us to organize this web session. And above all, I congratulate and thank all of our attendees sparing their valuable time who has joined this today's web seminar from the various industrial sectors. Friends, I would like to conclude today's sessions with a quote from Dow Brown, who said, safety is a common denominator across all aspects of life. Hence, knowledge should always be shared. It is not a matter for industry. It is a matter for life. Thank you very much. Stay safe, stay connected, and have a great evening. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Amma.